Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell, the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and I am here with my faithful sidekick, my eldritch assistant who never appears on camera, but quaffs me in these strange hats and the interesting drinks, Greg Kenny. Now, today we are continuing down Reconnaissance Row. We're going to take a bit of the Marine, Greg, into the Marine and talk about the Vought, the OS2U, the Kingfisher. But first, I'm going to get, I, Greg, I can't believe it's not butter. That's all I'm going to say. Somebody will get that at home. I'm showing my age. There you go. Now, today we're talking about really. This thing is massive, and we actually had one. Of, we had a kingfisher here. Do you remember that? We actually had one here uh, in the Pacific Hangar a long time ago when I first came here, and it went to the Overhazi, to the Smithsonian. They took it back, but it was huge, and it actually sat on wheels on the floats. And so I actually had one in this particular hangar, the Pacific hangar. Now, the interesting thing about this is we're, we're obviously at sea, and we're talking about reconnaissance. And this uh, aircraft uh, was certainly for about reconnaissance or all about reconnaissance, but it really cut its teeth along the lines with the Sikorsky and Martins uh, of the world, kind of the the Marine Rescue, the PBYs, uh, Catalinas, uh, doing rescue work in the Pacific. Uh, and it would, it would pick up down pilots, and we'll get to that. But its preliminary design in the beginning in 1938 was its first flight. It was retired in 1959. The interesting thing, Greg, the Soviets operated this aircraft as well under Lend-Lease. Uh, the Cubans in 1959 are the ones that retired it. So that kind of, it had quite a few operators. There were 1,519 of them built. It was primarily a reconnaissance aircraft that was launched off steam catapults on battleships and cruisers. And it was so big, if you ever seen one of these, you get why. I always thought in the scale, when you look at the ships, it's relatively small, but when you get up on one of these, they're actually pretty big. It was designed by Rex B. Beasel, and Rex, good old Rex, designed it as an observation aircraft. Now, why would you need one of those, Greg, or why would you need this, this aircraft? I'm going to go ahead and throw up a plan view. I'm going to have a one arm bigger than the other when I'm done with this. This thing weighs a ton. Throw up a plan view. Um, it's interesting how... What's old is new again. In Ukraine right now, you can see the Ukrainians using drones to sight artillery. And this goes all the way back to hot air balloons, uh, you know, and Civil War period and bef even before that, where uh, you never know what's going to happen with artillery, right? With It has a ballistic trajectory. It can be affected by propellant, wind, uh, the barrel, all kinds of stuff. So you have somebody up high on a hill or in a hot air balloon or an airplane, and when they see the shell land, the radio operator in this aircraft would call back to the battleship and say, you know, right 200, shorten it up by 100, and, and he would be an observer, much like a forward air observer is today, although in a lot of cases they're painting a target with a laser or something, so the airplane, they've taken a lot of the, I wouldn't say the fun out of it, but the the uncertainty out of it because these beam riders will ride a, a shell right into the target. But in the old days, and now again in Ukraine, uh, what they're using these observers for is to sight artillery. In this case, you're talking about naval artillery, naval guns. You have these big 16-inch guns uh, and even bigger on some of the uh, Japanese battleships that were throwing these projectiles at each other that were as large as small cars. And so these things originally were gonna go up and kind of search around and they'd find the enemy, or they would scout. Let's say the battleship or the cruiser didn't know where they were. Like a classic example of that would be the Battle of Midway. We knew sort of 
where the Japanese fleet was because we had done, we'd broken the Japanese naval code at that time and we ambushed them. The Japanese did not know where we were. They thought where we would be and they had a bunch of seaplanes out and scout aircraft out trying to find us. This, that's the other role of an aircraft like this would be to go out and scout. The bad part of that is, as you can see, this thing's pretty ungainly. If any of, the, of these aircraft, whether it be ours or the Axis or anything of a, a friend or foe, if they ran into a fighter, it's game over. Actually, I think, and you can argue with me in the comments, uh, if they ran into a SBD <laughs> or a VAL or anything on the other side, anything could shoot this down. This had an R980, R985 engine in it. It was underpowered. Most of these aircraft were, and they were, um, they were extremely dangerous to operate, to fly. Think about if you're Steam catapult doesn't work and you're getting shot off the battleship or whatever. There are no ejection seats in these airplanes and you were gonna ride that, this airframe all the way in. So I'm gonna put this 9,000 pound model on its spindle and I'm going to do my salute. And that is, and I'm gonna talk about, this took uh, a different type of pilot. It, you had to have nerves of steel. And the reason for that was uh, many times when they were, uh, especially later in the war, if we had pilots like in these, uh, the Wildcat or the Hellcat behind me or in any of these aircraft, and they ended up in the water, these aircraft would go out and get them. The challenge was you were most of the time or met a lot of the time, either at the mercy of Japanese uh, land-based guns, artillery, they'd be shooting at you because you, if you were shot down close enough, these guys would have to taxi in and any of these rescue aircraft would have to taxi in and, and get these folks. The difference between this and a Catalina uh, is primarily that you're not gonna put anybody on this. And so I'm gonna tell you how you, you could maybe get one guy in the, in the, maybe one or two, but that's about all you were gonna do. In most cases, especially with advanced search and rescue, as we got better at attacking islands, we had submarines, picket submarines out, and their total job was to pick up down flyers. But if you flew one of these off a battleship uh, or a cruiser, or this aircraft could actually be operated off land. Did you know that? The float came off and could be operated in a three-point stance. You had nerves of steel. I think, Greg, you're probably thinking I was going to say something else, but I didn't. But you had nerves of steel. So if you were a reconnaissance pilot in one of this type of aircraft during the war, I'm going to salute you today. And I, you know, that is one, I've never met a pilot that flew one of these. It would be interesting. If you see my video here, our video here, and you you flew one of these, shoot us a comment. I'd love to get you involved in our Veterans History Project and get some feedback. But this, this stuff was double tough. And so we're going to salute you today with Gus's Grown Up Soda. Greg, you're, you're scaring me here. It's, it's actually cold as well. And it, it looks edible. It's a 95 calorie uh, soda with juice concentrate from other natural flair, f flavors. Not too sweet. Let's see. Uh, uh, no caffeine. Contains 6% juice. So we'll see this. Are you trying? Are you concerned about my health, Greg? You're actually getting after juice. So to you reconnaissance pilots, <clears throat> or you you guys who flew picket duty, uh, down flyer picket duty, especially during World War II, I salute you. Um, it's gone. It's too bad. I was actually looking forward to this one. No, it has. It has gone to make, meet the great guts in the sky. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's tainted, let's say. Let's see. Uh, second tip, which is customary, and then maybe a trip to the, uh, to the ER. 
Mm. Well, to Gus, hopefully one day I'll actually get to uh, enjoy your your soda that hasn't uh, gone to its maker. So if you were dealing with the kingfisher during the war, uh, the thing that you would do if you were not observing, because remember, there weren't a lot of fleet battles in the Pacific in World War II. There were long range carrier actions, but these aircraft never really participated very much in what uh, naval uh, designers thought would happen at the time. And, and strategists was that you had these two lines of battle wagons line, line up. These guys would be up and they basically just duke it out and whoever didn't lose uh, ships uh, the, or whoever lost the fewest number of ships would win, uh, kind of a Napoleonic warfare view of it. The reality was we were dealing with the aircraft carrier, which completely changed the game, and that relegated this. It did some search, but primarily uh, search and rescue. There was a radio operator in there, so he could call back, plus a gunner and a pilot. Uh, this type actually uh, recovered Eddie Rickenbacker, who was shot down in the and recovered him, and the other guy who made his name in this aircraft was John Burns. He's a guy, and Greg can find some graphic where you've ever seen it, where he's taxiing around with a whole bunch of uh, aviators on his wings, and he taxied to the submarine the Tang, the Tang, and he was awarded and received the Navy Cross for that. So that's a big deal. And and the reason he received that is because he had all those people on his wings, he was not going anywhere. And so extremely, extremely dangerous outing there. Now, the other comparable aircraft uh, there were the Achi, or Aichi, I should say, the E-13A, the Arado, the AR-196, the Curtis Seagull, and the Curtis, and I don't know who's naming aircraft at, at Curtis, but the CMU, CMU. I don't know why we would be, somebody needs to talk to whoever was around at that time as to, would you be afraid of, oh my gosh, we're being attacked by a bunch of CMUs? It doesn't do anything. And Greg's like, nope, I don't get it. So the aircraft uh, continued on uh, primarily as a patrol airplane at that point. It would, it would fly on patrol missions, and it served with various countries until it was eventually retired, as I said, by Cuba in 1959. It is extremely well represented in museums, and that, I think, comes from the fact that it was primarily on these capital ships, and when they came back and they were either scrapped or retrofitted, these aircraft came off. And so there are quite a few of them in museums. So if you want to see one, like I said, I believe, if they, unless they've taken it off display, there's a real nice one in uh, Uvarhazi. Now, if you like Chance Vought and you want to wear it with pride, reach out to us because you can be the first on your block to have a Chance Vought America's Fastest Aircraft t-shirt. Jason will run down really fast because Jason is one of the fastest moving people I know. And he will happily send you one of these shirts by fast mail. Right, Craig? Absolutely. If you came across us on YouTube or on Facebook, if you're on YouTube and you like military aircraft videos, forward us to your friends. Give us a subscription and a like. Also on Facebook, we would love to get your like and a comment. We absolutely love that, and we will comment back to you. We cannot do all of this stuff and keep all these aircraft airworthy without your donations. There is a link on this video, so give us a few bucks if you have the time and the thought process to do it. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much. Have a great day.